Hello. God bless you all. It's a great joy to share God's Word with you again today and to uh, give a, a bigger sense of God's purposes and guidance in our world. The situation in our country seems to be very stressful, very tense, a lot of divisiveness, even within families and friendships. And uh, the more I've thought about this, the more I've thought, well, there are many situations in the Bible that were far worse, and there were godly people that spoke up, that to, which, to whom uh, God gave special messages that we still use today, and messages that were, in fact, uh, helpful in paving the way for Jesus' ministry. So I thought today we would look at uh, some of the writings of the prophet Micah, a fairly brief book. Don't be ashamed if you have to look in the uh, index in the beginning of your Bible to find the exact page. Uh, Micah is probably just four or five pages long in your Bible. But it is an amazing book full of memorable statements and we'll notice some of those uh, today, more of them another time as well. Mecca lived in, in a tremendously stressful, divisive time uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, first of all, within the country of Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel, right after Solomon's reign, the nation of Israel split into two parts. Ten of the tribes were called Israel or the northern kingdom. And two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, were the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom was based in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom was based in Samaria and uh, had a tremendous uh, number of people and uh, numerous kings over the years. The tragic story of the northern kingdom is that there were no godly kings. The kings were constantly uh, submissive to uh, their own selfishness, their own greed, and also submission to pagan gods and goddesses that were corrupt and misleading and very often idolatry and adultery go together where the pagan gods and goddesses of that time, the, the temples included male and female prostitutes as part of what they called worship. And in the southern kingdom, there was a lot of that too. Less than half of the kings in the southern kingdom were godly people. So that uh, the nation of Israel was a far cry from God's vision of what it could be. The nation of priests where everyone represents the living God to one another, even the, the children and, and women and men, to, in, you know, wherever they were, to represent God, to really remind people of the living God. Because all of us are God's images. All of us are in God's likeness. And the responsibility that God gave to the people of Israel, even before the giving of the Ten Commandments, that responsibility of representing him to one another was a great gift, but not treasured. So that as time went on, we were reminded of time with the, the uh, uh, grandfather clock here. As time went on, then people became more and more alienated from God. And Solomon himself, tragic because he was so wise and yet did not follow his own wisdom. Uh, very uh, disappointing to God and disappointing to all of us that, that treasure wisdom and, and think when you've got it, you ought to use it. So in Micah's time, where Micah actually ministered for 55 years, and in his time of ministry, there were three different kings. I think it was Joash and then Ahaz, not Ahab, uh, though they had similar personalities. And then the third king was Hezekiah. So of the three kings that he 
was a prophet under that where he gave the word of the Lord to the people and gave some advice to the authorities as well. During that time in his country, the Southern Kingdom, uh, two out of three were ungodly people and uh, it was only Hezekiah that uh, very wonderfully, very miraculously through the raising up his uh, mother uh, had a great love for the living God and as soon as his father died, he the first thing he did was clean up the temple because his father Ahaz had taken out the the altar to God, altar to the living God, where uh, God's sacrifices had been made earlier, and replaced it with a uh, altar to one of the sex gods that required human babies to be offered as sacrifice. So even in the temple that Solomon had built and was dedicated to the Lord, and the Lord had honored uh, by you know, having a fire from heaven come down for the, for the sacrifices during the dedication of the temple, even there, uh, that temple was polluted by one of the kings, one of the awful kings under the ministry, during the ministry of Micah. So divisiveness, because there were still godly people that really cared that things were done right, cared that the temple be truly devoted to the living God, the God Most High, and, and not this uh, awful uh, stuff. One of the reasons, by the way, that Ahaz was committed to this uh, terrible God, Moloch, that required these awful sacrifices, was that was the main God of the Assyrians, the uh, country uh, based in Nineveh, where the uh, people uh, were uh, constantly harassing the people of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and it, they were threats. They were even very vicious threats. They were they fought like the ISIS warriors that you've heard about in the Middle East that that uh, demean uh, their victims in every way uh, before they kill them. It's just uh, uh, unhuman and ungodly. So the Assyrians intimidated. Uh, the kings of the northern kingdom and southern kingdom and and the northern kingdom fell and, and disappeared during Micah's lifetime, during his ministry. Uh, and during the time that uh, Hezekiah was king, the northern kingdom was done. All the people had been taken off into slavery. Now, in the meantime, Micah is concerned about people's behavior so that he reports the problems that people are having in their relationships with their neighbors and their relatives and uh, their customers and their businesses, that they were constantly involved in fraud. People were constantly stealing from one another. Uh, the uh, greed uh, was uh, rampant, and people were especially targeting uh, those that were... Uh, somewhat defenseless, like widows. Debauchery was rampant. Uh, people hated good and loved evil. All these are, are statements out of the first uh, three chapters of uh, Micah. They were oppressing one another. They were devoted to lives of injustice. Um, murder was uh, a, a constant threat. Uh, Judges taking bribes and other uh, government officials, dishonest measurements for merchandise. You uh, you want you know say a pound of uh, flour, and the person weighs it on the scale, but the scale is broken, is is adjusted to give you less than what you are paying for. Uh, so the you know the basic business ethics was uh, not respected. Extortion and lying, um, working hard but with no fruit, no harvest, uh, and other uh, uh, sins of uh, disregard for the value of human life. But at the same time, the, while all this disruption was happening, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom were often fighting because the northern kingdom 
really uh, had a greed, a, a, a tremendous uh, 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 kind of a, a, a deep desire to take over Jerusalem. Jerusalem was still the gem that that everyone loved, and the the architecture, the temple, and so forth was uh, precious in all the Jewish people's eyes. And so they were constantly fighting their own brothers and sisters in the southern kingdom to try to take over. And in the process to steal jewelry and goods and, and crops uh, to uh, take them back home to the northern uh, kingdom. So when we're worried about America being very divisive, we have a good reason to worry but it's not in the same level of divisiveness that uh, Micah is experiencing and that God is speaking out against. And the ministry of Micah was to bring hope, bring guidance, uh, bring a message from the Lord. And so we're going to look at two uh, briefly in uh, Micah, the, the trend toward the writing of the, his book uh, of uh, seven chapters, more details, more specific issues of the time in the first uh, three chapters or so, and then in chapter four and five and six and seven, uh, great messages that reverberate even to our own time in uh, very powerful ways. So, for example, uh, to look briefly at the beginning of chapter four, um, Micah is uh, talking about that uh, uh, God wants to reestablish his presence in the, the mountains of the southern kingdom and that many nations will then come in verse 2 of uh, chapter 4. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And, and uh, these, these were the things people, according to Micah, should be saying. Uh, as they make a pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem and to the temple and, and to uh, really experience the, uh, freshly the power of the Lord. The law will go out from Zion. Zion is the, the high hill, the, the mountain on which Jerusalem was built. And uh, the word of the Lord uh, from Jerusalem. So it's the, the word of the Lord is treated almost as a person. The word of the Lord will be heard from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many people. He will settle disputes that nations have. You know, what an idea, even for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom to appeal to the Lord to settle disputes rather than killing each other off. And then this wonderful line that is quoted, I think, two or three different places on the campus of the United Nations right here in New York, that uh, the people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up a sword against any other nation, nor will they train for war anymore. What a wonderful vision, a vision adopted as a great goal of our United Nations as well. And this very text, from Micah chapter 4, especially verses uh, 3 and 4, it is uh, quoted at the United Nations. Sometimes a very similar text from Isaiah uh, is quoted, and uh, they both lived at the same time, actually, so that um, Isaiah was writing out of the same uh, place of stress. And then in verse 5, still chapter 4, all the nations... Uh, may walk in the name of their gods. You know, the nations may come for wisdom to Jerusalem, but they still may be walking in the name of their gods. But we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. So not intimidated that there would be other people of uh, different theologies, different understandings of God, uh, but instead... Uh, being bold in our faith in the living God, the one who is the Lord, the one who is Yahweh. And uh, so this great vision is uh, laid out. However, at the end of chapter 4, Micah records 
uh, that uh, nevertheless, although this is the vision going forward, that the southern kingdom and the city would, would become subjugated by the uh, Babylonians and would be in captivity or exile before these promises could be fulfilled. And that didn't happen right away. That was another hundred years away. Uh, the time that, even the time that uh, Micah finished his ministry, it was almost still another hundred years before the people of Israel uh, in the southern kingdom were overrun by the Babylonians. And some of our heroes like uh, Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Ezekiel uh, and others were uh, taken off as slaves. And Jeremiah remained in Jerusalem, still uh, uh, teaching the ways of the Lord. Now in the next chapter, and we're going to uh, focus on this now as, as our uh, main chorus here together, in the very next chapter, Micah records some amazing description about Jesus, description about his role as our Messiah, as the, the promised one that would release people from all these bad behaviors, all this tragedy, all this crumbling society around them, and, and give hope, give salvation, give peace. And this is a very special text because of the hundreds of Bible texts from the Old Testament where there's a prophecy about Jesus. This is the only one that was quoted positively to identify Jesus during his earthly ministry about 400 years later. And this is the great text that when the Magi came from the East, probably from more than one different country, came from the East, converged in uh, Jerusalem, and they were called in by Herod to find out why they were uh, watching the star and what they were having a pilgrimage for. And they said that there was a king that was born, king of the Jews, and they wanted to come and worship him. So clearly more than just your average king or princely baby, but uh, but someone who was uh, divine, someone who was very special. And uh, we understand that uh, people from the East probably had read Daniel because uh, Daniel had, had written in Babylon, uh, which was East. And there's a, a record of many uh, Jewish uh, settlements in what we would call Western India and, and uh, Pakistan um, because of the exile, because of the captivity, uh, and they had the scriptures and they had you know, given a lot of thought to the Messiah coming and calculated the dates and so forth. So that there was a whole rich soil of thought and hope and uh, excitement in, in, under which the, uh, in, in, by means of which the Magi developed an understanding that, that God himself would be the, the new king and would be born as a baby and and, you know, there was this uh, eager expectation. So when they saw the special star, they had some knowledge already of uh, God's plan because they had read uh, the scriptures and they had heard other uh, background knowledge and wisdom. So, but when they uh, told Herod what they were looking for, Herod was clueless. So he uh, had the Magi leave and called in the Jewish teachers and said, where's the Messiah going to be born? And they quoted Micah. Micah chapter 5. And the, the puzzling thing, the tragic thing, uh, the engaging fact, is that they got it right. Even though re they refused to recognize Jesus a few years later, uh, and they could have calculated the time. They could have told stories. They could have been more alert. But they refused to recognize Jesus later. In fact, the, the one thing they got right was where Messiah was to be born, in Bethlehem. But all the other details recorded by Micah, they ignored. They didn't teach. 
they didn't use to recognize Jesus. And so their, their selective Bible knowledge is really a, a model of being unfaithful. To just look for an answer where you have to have an answer, but not letting the Word change their lives, not letting the Word shape how they would respond to God's gift of his Messiah. So very deep tragedy, these teachers, Jewish teachers at the time of Jesus' birth, and those teachers, some of them the same people, uh, some years later during Jesus' ministry, who were only there uh, trying to trip him up, which of course they were unsuccessful at, but uh, trying to demean him rather than being open to the Spirit of God and what God had for them. So let's look very briefly at the first few verses of, of uh, Micah chapter 5 and see what Micah has to say in terms of who Messiah is, who uh, Jesus is. So in verse 1, uh, there is a, a reference to um, the Messiah being a, a ruler, a, a leader, and it's, um, you know, marshal your, your troops, O a city of troops, perhaps a reference to Jerusalem, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler, as, a, as you know, the soldiers did beat on uh, Jesus and then play the game, uh, insisting Jesus say who it was, terrible, and you know, and on the cheek with a rod. But in verse 2, this is the part that the teachers got right, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. So they got it right, Bethlehem, as the uh, place of the Messiah's birth. But even before that sentence is over, the record of uh, Micah is that he will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And literally, what Micah says here is his origins are from eternity. He's the ancient of days, which is a, a, a Hebrew expression of, of God, who is God, the, the one who is the most ancient, who, who precedes time. And, and so the passage here that they quoted, the very verse that they quoted to pick out Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus, when they reported that to Herod in the Christmas story, in that same verse, it, it makes it clear Messiah is God. The very thing that they were offended by, the very thing they tried Jesus for, was claiming to be God. But it was in the same verse from which they answered Herod. What a, an amazing irony that it was there in plain view. It was there so utterly clear in a verse they had probably read many times, and then that memorable moment where Herod had to have an answer. So in verse 2, we're affirmed that Jesus is from eternity. Now we get that from John chapter 1. Jesus is referred to as the Word. Uh, all things were made by the Word. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Uh, so, uh, and that Jesus was God. Uh, the Word was with God. The Word was God. So these amazing statements about Jesus as the Word of God in the first three verses of chapter 1 of John uh, affirm the same point. Messiah is God. The, the bridge between God and human is God. And that's wonderful because we know that, that he's responsible for the God side of the reconciliation. He is the initiator for reconciliation with us. He is the bridge to God because he is God. And then later in the Gospel according to John, uh, uh, Jesus references himself as the I Am uh, several times actually. So that 
again, Jesus identified himself as, as the living God, as Yahweh, uh, who, who is the I am of the Hebrew scriptures. Now, Muhammad, and in the Quran, there is a, a, a total rejection of any possibility that, that God could become human, that there could be the incarnation of, of the Messiah, of uh, God himself in human form. And the, and the only argument that uh, Muhammad proposes is that then God would be vulnerable. And God can't be vulnerable. He can't be subject to pain. Uh, uh, that that baby might have been killed. Herod might have had his way. But of course we know that's not true because God is still sovereign. God had his own protection. He had put Joseph in charge and trusted Joseph. And Joseph was faithful when he saw the vision and heard the voice of God to, to leave immediately, to leave before sunrise, to escape because uh, someone was trying to kill the baby. Um, God knew that Joseph would be faithful and protect baby Jesus. So yes, but God is still vulnerable. Um, the Muslims are wrong. We need a God who is vulnerable and at the same time, in his own genius and strength, uh, to always be successful, to always be uh, the God who is in charge. So the text says, the very text says that uh, Jesus is God. And, and uh, then in verse 3, that he will draw people, including Jews, back to God from geographically distant areas. And of course, part of the ministry of St. Paul was to draw Jewish people from all over the Roman Empire to Christ. He would go to synagogues first. When he went to any town, he would go to a synagogue to uh, uh, bring the message of the gospel. And um, at the same time, uh, shortly after, uh, to bring the gospel also to uh, Gentiles in that uh, area. But Jesus certainly fulfilled this role of a drawing of a full range of people, Jews and non-Jews, to uh, the gospel, to his ministry, to relationship with him, as in verse 3. Then in verse 4, he will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. You know, going back to uh, the Muslim objection God, the strength of the Lord is still with Jesus. He did amazing miracles. He was protected in all kinds of very risky environments um, and then chose to submit to the cross for the fulfillment of the gospel, for the fulfillment of his role as the, pass the ultimate Passover lamb at the time of Passover, that very year when he died. So the strength of the Lord is is the message here also now in verse 4. And then he will lead us in majesty, in the majesty of the name of the Lord. This emphasis on the name of the Lord, the, the name Yahweh, the name, the living God, uh, so strong. Jesus taught us as the you know beginning of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer, the 22nd prayer, prayer that takes 20 seconds, maybe 25 seconds, depending on how fast you talk, but this very brief prayer, right at the beginning, holy is your name. The special role of the name of God in Jesus' ministry, in our lives, holy is your name. And as we mentioned before, many times Jesus used the I am as a reference to himself. Sometimes it's you know, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. But probably most dramatically, at the end of uh, John 8, Jesus said, before Abram was, I am. A very strong statement of being God, even before Abraham, uh, which would, you know, make him uh, more than 2,000 years old, of course, because he's eternal. He is the eternal Messiah. And, and then when they arrested him, this is a uh, close second, when the soldiers uh, were coming to arrest Jesus, 
Jesus stepped forward. He didn't wait for them to grab him or didn't wait for uh, Judas to kiss him first. He just asked, who are you looking for? And, and they said, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus' answer was, I am. Not, I am he. Now, the translators think you have to add that word he at that point. But, but that's not what Jesus said. He simply said, I am. And then the Bible text says, and the soldiers fell to the ground. Perhaps they had some knowledge of the Jewish scriptures and how powerful the name I am is as the name of the living God. He is the I am. He is the I breathe of all life. He is this amazing being. And Jesus simply said, I am. In Greek, ego eimi. And they collapse. Tough. Uh, strong, courageous Roman soldiers collapse onto the ground. Had to shake the dust off the off them to get up and then uh, arrest Jesus. But, um, you know, very remarkable reminder of how powerful the I am name of God is and still is in our lives. He is the I am that we can trust. He is the I breathe that gives us life, that gives us hope, that brings life to our hopes, brings life to our dreams, brings life to our purposes that each of us has as, as his creation. And that is emphasized there in verse 4. And then one other uh, thing, his greatness and authority will cover the whole earth. And so the gospel has spread out all over. Even during Jesus' lifetime, there were people from several different countries that met him. Even uh, the, like the Greeks, uh, the, just two or three days before he died for us. And then shortly after, the Ethiopian uh, official treasurer, uh, national treasurer, uh, met uh, the evangelist Philip. And, and so there, there is a quick engagement with people from all over the world uh, with the gospel. Uh, and, um, and that proceeded further out and further out. Thomas going to India and... Uh, evidence that there were people that brought the gospel to China uh, within just a few years of Jesus' ministry on earth. And and then this amazing, finally in verse uh, 5, chapter 5, verse 5, this amazing first line, and he, the Messiah, Jesus, will be their peace. Isn't that amazing? Not just bring peace. That's wonderful. Please, more of it. Uh, not just be a symbol of peace, not just be a, a presence that where people uh, are acting a little more peaceful, but especially the time of turmoil, turmoil of Micah's time, a time of turmoil in our own time, uh, this promise that Jesus is our peace. To embrace Jesus is to embrace peace. Meaning, when we have Jesus, we're going to be working better with other people, even disgusting people. <laughs> Thankfully, because we are the source of improvement. We are the, the living standard as Jesus is working in us and as we are part of him, as we are in his body. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. And as we step forward, uh, we have peace because we have Jesus, who is our peace. Just a few days, uh, about a week after Jesus was born, uh, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple, and a prophet named Simeon saw Jesus and knew God gave him the extraordinary wisdom to know that this is the Messiah, this is the promised one. And Simeon then says, to all those around, including, of course, uh, Mary and Joseph, that this baby is our salvation. Now, we'll, that will provide salvation, though that's true too. But he is God's gift of salvation. It's very personal, very 
uh, concrete, very specific. Jesus is our salvation. Now, the message of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, uh, the theology of Jesus, these all matter. But we need Jesus himself, who is our peace. We need Jesus himself, who is our salvation. So just to remind you of these seven ways in which the leaders, the teachers of Israel, even though they read the text, they missed seven different points here in the first five verses of Micah 5. But we have them and we can grow in them. We can build our lives, grow our faith, encourage others, be a source of light when we affirm these truths that Jesus is the ultimate ruler. Verse 1, Jesus is from eternity. He is God and human, and he brings the amazing power and presence of God into reconciliation. So we know it's for real. God is reconciling to us because he is Jesus. Jesus is God. And the third point, uh, to draw people back to God in verse 3. In verse 4, beginning verse 4, that he came in the strength of the Lord, the very strength of the Lord. Vulnerable, yet in the strength of the Lord. In the middle part of verse 3, that he will lead us in the majesty of the name of God. Wow, and we talked about how that name played a huge role in Jesus' ministry, teaching us how to pray, holy is your name, teaching us that he is the I am before Abraham. He is the I am that just by saying those words uh, make uh, these strong soldiers, Roman soldiers, to collapse on the dirt. So he is the marvelous majesty is the marvelous majesty of the name of God and his authority will cover the whole earth wherever we are we can trust him and then finally and very importantly he is our peace like Simeon also said he is our salvation so hey you're better than the Jewish teachers of Jesus time and better than our Jewish friends now who deny all these seven points about Jesus, but were taught. These points were taught 700 years before Jesus, taught by Micah, the prophet. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Great God, we thank you for the faithful ministry of Micah, the prophet, and thank you that even though the Jewish people, Jewish leaders, uh, apparently just believed a, a, a one line of this text in the uh, beginning of chapter 5 of Micah, that the whole thing is true, and we can turn to you, Lord, and find the one who is truly the ruler, the one who is from eternity, the one who draws all people, the one who is the strength of the Lord, the one who leads in the majesty of the name of the Lord, the one who's influence and grace is poured out over the whole earth and the one who is our peace. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. For all that you are, whether the Jewish teachers took the time to read the whole text thoroughly and accountably, we know that this is what you taught and this is who you are. Messiah, Jesus, Jesus the Christ. We embrace you, we seek all of you as we step forward in this disruptive, this uh, divisive, uh, this uh, often risky time, but a time that so much needs you, Lord Jesus, so much needs you, Messiah Jesus, so much needs you as peace as the ultimate peace. Thank you in Jesus' holy, precious name. 
Amen.